Well, hello everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening. Um, uh, Professor Sandel very much wanted people to keep their videos on if they if they could, if they had sufficient bandwidth for it. So it's really nice to see everybody's faces. Um, we have a wonderful turnout uh, for this conversation and I'm really, really excited to, to welcome all of you. I believe we are going to have uh, 65 years of Rhodes Scholars from the class of 1955 to the class of 2020. That's rather remarkable and a beautiful example of our lifelong fellowship and of, of learning across uh, generations. So uh, my name is Elizabeth Keish. I'm the, the warden of Rhodes House. I am thrilled to be in conversation uh, with Professor Michael Sandel, who is Massachusetts and Balliol, 1975, um, in the Rhodes, uh, Rhodes uh, parlance. Um, and he is the Ann T. and Robert M. Bass Professor of Government Theory at Harvard University. He's very well known for many things, but one of them is for having taught off and on, he, he told me, but since 1980, a course on justice, uh, that I you know, remember so many uh, of my friends having had, um, having kind of cut their eye teeth on questions about uh, ethics and justice and political theory uh, by, by taking Professor Sandel's course. Um, he's, he has taken that course uh, uh, through, through virtual means to an audience of, of many, many people all over the world. Um, he, is the author of seven books, I think. I think I have that right. Um, uh, from uh, including liberalism and the limits of justice, uh, justice, what's the right thing to do, what money can't buy, the moral limits of markets, uh, and uh, most recently, um, just out this this uh, year, and which is what we'll be talking about today, uh, the tyranny of merit, what's become of the common good. He's been called by none other than another actual public intellectual and philosopher, Michael Ignatieff, as the most famous teacher of philosophy in the world. Um, somebody who's shown that it's possible to take philosophy into the public square without insulting the public's intelligence. He's trying to force open a space for a discourse on civic virtue that he believes has been abandoned by both left and right. Um, and I also want to mention that we've had a group of our Rhodes Scholars in Residence who've been reading um, uh, Professor Sandel's latest book, The Tyranny of Merit, and about 25 of you actually, really, that makes me, I have to say, that makes my heart sing, um, that <laughs> 25 of our Scholars in Residence are, are reading this book and arguing over it. Um, and I do want to give a shout out to Lucas Tay, who is a 2018 Rhodes Scholar from Hong Kong. Um, I can brag about him that he is, uh, he won the All Souls Prize Fellowship. So he is now an examination fellow of All Souls College, but he's the one who sort of initiated this. He is quickly going to assert that this was a group effort and lots of other people were involved. Um, uh, but, but he was the one who first approached us to say, wouldn't it be wonderful to engage the broader Rhodes community of, of scholars in residence and alumni scholars in, in thinking about these, these critically important issues. I also wanna thank my wonderful colleague, Rodolfo Lara, who is our director of global engagement and himself a, a fan of, uh, of Professor Sandel's work and of many other uh, uh, works of, of philosophy and Georgie Thurston, who uh, our colleague Georgie Thurston, who is uh, the person who is managing all of this and making sure that if you need um, closed captioning, you have that, or if you have any um, issues uh, with, with technology that she can, she can help you out. So the way we're gonna be doing this is I'll start in kind of conversation with, with Michael Sandel, um, spend uh, probably about 30 minutes or so in that first phase. And then what we agreed is that we would give the first set of questions and comments to our scholar and residents uh, reading group. So uh, uh, we, we will ask for any questions or comments from them and 
then we will open it up. And I know that um, Michael Sandel is eager to hear your, your questions and uh, really pleased to be, to be here in community with all of you. So uh, Michael, thank you so much for, for joining us. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. It, what an honor to be with you and with Rhodes Scholars in residence uh, and alums like me around the world. And I didn't expect that I would revisit Rhodes House in this virtual fashion until fairly recently, but uh, it's a blessing that it's possible and a great privilege, Elizabeth, to be in conversation with you. So thank you for convening us. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. So let's begin. Um, we're, we are gonna focus on your latest book, um, which doesn't mean people can't ask you about earlier works, of course, uh, but, um, but your latest book, The Tyranny of Merit, What's Become of the Common Good, is really set in the context of the Trump presidency and the rise of authoritarian populism worldwide. And you argue that the populist uprising that we've seen in the United States um, in the last few years, and also of course around the world, and we have scholars here from around the world who have been experiencing that in their own countries, is, is more than a protest against white privilege or the decline of white privilege and the impacts of globalization. It's more than a, uh, more than a protest against uh, immigration or outsourcing. You argue that it is a complaint against the tyranny of merit. And you also claim provocatively that that complaint is justified. And so I wanna begin because not everybody will have read your book by just asking if you could briefly tell us what is the tyranny of merit and briefly what's wrong with it. Right. Well, thank you for setting out really the occasion for the book, Elizabeth, which I was really prompted to think about and to write trying to make sense of the events of 2016. The populist backlash against elites that we saw with the election of Donald Trump in the US, with the vote for Brexit in Britain, and with, as you say, Elizabeth, the rise of populist, uh, populist backlash in many countries, roiling, the, roiling democratic politics around the world. It has many sources, including the ones you enumerated at the outset, having to do with immigrants and xenophobia and fears about globalization, racism, misogyny. These are all ingredients in the appeals made by Trump and figures like him. But I think it's too easy and too comforting for those of us who are distressed by this turn in democratic public life, to say it's only about those things. I think it's also about the tyranny of merit, which is, as you suggest, it's a paradoxical thought. Let me try to explain. For decades, the divide between winners and losers has been deepening, poisoning our politics and driving us apart. And this has partly to do with the widening inequalities of income and wealth that we've seen with four decades of globalization. But I think it's not only that. It has also to do, I think, with changing attitudes toward success, toward winning and losing, that has accompanied this deepening inequality. Those who've landed on top have come to believe that their success is their own doing, the measure of their merit, and that those who fall short, those who are struggling by implication, have no one to blame but themselves. And the reason that underlies these changing attitudes towards success, the, the growing meritocratic hubris, as I call it in the book, 
it's connected to a certain seemingly attractive political ideal, the ideal of meritocracy, the ideal that if chances are equal, or if we could one day make them more or less equal, then the winners deserve their winnings. They deserve the benefits that flow from the exercise of their talents. If we think about the, the political message of mainstream political parties, of the center right and the center left over the past three or four decades, the central theme of it has really been this. If you wanna compete and win in the global economy, go to college. If you wanna defeat wage stagnation and job loss, go to college, you too can rise. The answer to the deepening inequality offered by mainstream politicians was individual upward mobility through attending college. Now, there is something inspiring in saying, we are going to try to create a truly level playing field. We are going to try to make it so that everyone will be able to rise without obstacle, regardless of background, as far as their talents and efforts will take them. And how often have we heard this slogan? You can make it if you try. So it's inspiring in a way, but it's invidious in another. What these elites failed to see was the insult implicit in the offer. The insult is, if you didn't go to college, and if you're not flourishing in the new economy, your failure is your fault. Those of us who's, who spend our days in the company of the credentialed can easily forget the simple fact that most people don't have a four-year college degree. In the US, nearly two-thirds don't. Similar figure in Britain and in most European democracies. But what we've done is to create an economy, but also a mode of justification for winning and losing that assumes that people can rise if only they go to college. And this I think has created, it's generated hubris among the winners and humiliation among those left behind. And so this I think is the backdrop to the Trump election in 2016. And while Joe Biden, it's interesting, Joe Biden emphasized understandably his working class roots and sympathies. In fact, Joe Biden, it's worth noticing, was the first Democratic nominee in 36 years without an Ivy League degree, which shows the hold of this credentialist meritocratic picture on politics, especially on the Democratic Party, Labor Party in Britain, social democratic parties in Europe. But still, even with Biden's election, this pattern of disaffection, of grievance, of resentment has not really been put to rest. Here's one example. In 2016 against Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump got, tw uh, got 67%, two thirds of white voters without a college education without a college degree, rather. This time he got 64% of that group. So this basic pattern remains in place and I think it will continue to, to poison our politics and to contribute to the polarization that we see until we find a way of shifting the terms of public discourse, Elizabeth, to address it. Mm. So what would your, you know, I'm, I know we've all been riveted by the roller coaster ride of the last uh, week. What would your advice be to President-elect Biden? My first piece of advice would be to focus less than your predecessor on the rhetoric of rising, on the rhetoric that responds to inequality 
by offering individual upward mobility if you get a college degree, because that helps relatively few people. I would, I would suggest uh, focus less on the rhetoric of rising, less on arming people for meritocratic competition and focus more on figuring out how to make life better for most people, for Americans who contribute to the common good through the work they do, through the families they raise, the communities they serve, even though most of them don't have a four-year college degree, which is to say shift the political agenda and the political project toward figuring out how we can renew the dignity of work. Less about rising, more about affirming the dignity of work. And across the parties, across competing ideologies, people will have different views about how in practice to realize the dignity of work. But that I think would be a healthier debate. And it would be a debate that would focus more squarely on a vast number of people, including working people, who've been, who, who feel rightly that not only the economy, but also the culture have left them behind. You know, it's interesting. We've had a lot of conversation in recent months about COVID and the impact of COVID on getting all of us to rethink what is essential work. You know, who right. are the workers in our society who keep things together in a, in a pandemic? And so, you know, I wonder, do, do you see any signs of, uh, of, the pandemic leading to a reevaluation of the dignity of work, particularly work. Some of, of course, some of it is college educated nurses and doctors, but there's a lot of, of work that is absolutely essential to keeping societies going um, that, that does not require a college education. So do you see signs of that? Yes, there are, there are signs and this, I think, Elizabeth, is one of the silver linings, one of the potential openings that has come with this pandemic. Those of us who have the luxury of working from home, of holding meetings on Zoom, can't help but notice how deeply we depend on workers we often overlook. And I'm thinking not only of those working in the hospitals to care for COVID patients, but delivery workers, warehouse workers, grocery store clerks, home healthcare, providers, childcare providers, truckers. These are not the best paid or most honored workers in our societies. And yet now we are calling them, as you point out, essential workers or key workers in Britain. So this could be the beginning of an opportunity, if we seize it, an opportunity for a broader public debate about how to bring their pay and also their recognition into better alignment with the importance of the work they do. We assume too easily, we slide into the assumption that the money people make is the measure of their contribution to the common good. But this is a mistake. We can think of lots of examples of jobs and social roles that are lavishly remunerated whose contribution to the common good is subject, shall we say gently, to, uh, to argument. Whereas those who contribute, and I'm thinking, for example, of those in the higher reaches of some of the speculative forms of finance, the, 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 the lavish pay uh, given those who have figured out to do high speed, high frequency trading, shaving a, 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 millis a millisecond off the speed of a trade, does that compensation really reflect such an outsized contribution to the economy or to the common good that it deserves to be a thousand times what uh, the pay of, say, a nurse or a school teacher or a physician, for that matter? So I think there is room. What we've done in recent decades in the decade of, uh, decades of market-driven globalization has in effect 
been to outsource our moral judgments about contribution to the market. I think we need to reclaim those judgments and those debates for democratic citizens to argue together and reason together about what really counts as a valuable contribution to the, social, to the common good, and then to reconfigure the economy in a way that can reflect that. So I, I, I wanna ask you some questions about kind of the structural implications of this, but I, first I wanna take it personal. <laughs> um, so, I mean, we, we, we chatted briefly last week and both uh, commented on, you know, the, the, the irony of a Rhodes Scholar community conversation about this. Um, and, and of course, uh, also acknowledge that, you know, you, you have spent your career at Harvard. I mean, so we're talking about two institutions, the Rhodes Scholarship and, um, and Harvard University that are really at the top of kind of global symbols of meritocratic elitism, credentialism. Uh, mm -hmm. So t tell us, how have you navigated those tensions and contradictions personally? And, you know, what advice would you have for, for today's Rhodes Scholars or indeed today's uh, Rhodes House Wardens <laughs> for, right. Right. for how to avoid that hubris trap of credentialism, how actually to act on personally on what you right. know. All right. Well, let me try to respond, Elizabeth, both to the personal dimension and to the broader institutional dimension. Let me take the institutional dimension first because in some ways that's a little bit easier. We have, and you mentioned my own institutional affiliations and the, the Rhodes Scholarship and Harvard and so on. We have in the United States especially, a very steep hierarchy of prestige between higher education on the one hand and the forms of learning on which most people depend to equip themselves for the world of work on the other. And so for one thing, in terms of sheer investment, we woefully underinvest in forms of learning on which most working people depend. I'm thinking of state colleges, two-year community colleges, and vocational and technical training uh, uh, forms of learning. Compared to European countries, we invest far less in these forms of education. Um, even though our system of higher education is a great success and the envy of many countries around the world. So I think that's one place to start if we want to affirm the dignity of work. But it isn't only a matter of investment, financial investment. I think it's also a matter of finding ways to reconsider this steep hierarchy of prestige, of esteem. Because what, what's out of align, alignment is not only pay, wages and pay, compensation, but also the economy of esteem. And this is a harder thing to try to rethink and recast, but it connects in a way with the other part, the harder part of your question, Elizabeth, about the more personal dimension of this. The, what, what really is required, I think, to rein in the tyranny of merit is not only to consider a range of institutional reforms to renew and strengthen the dignity of work, uh, also, I think, to question whether we want higher education to be the ultimate arbiter of opportunity in the society. We've come to take that for granted. I think we need to reconsider that for a number of reasons, not only because it leads to, the, to this harsh ethic of success and to the great many people being excluded, but also because I think it's damaging even to higher education itself. We can perhaps come to that later. But I think this project of reigning in the tyranny of merit also requires a kind of moral and spiritual turning. This comes to the, to the personal dimension of the question. I think we need to rethink our own 
and here our own, I'm referring to this community gathered here, our own meritocratic hubris, the tendency, our tendency to, to inhale rather deeply of our own success, to for, forget the luck and good fortune that helped us on our way and to forget our sense of indebtedness. Those who believe this matters for the common good because ultimately my worry, Elizabeth, is that meritocracy is corrosive of the common good. That's the, that's the ultimate effect of the tyranny of merit on our public life. And it's corrosive of the common good because forgetting the role of luck and fortune makes it very hard for the successful to see themselves in other people's shoes, being alive to the role of luck in one's own life can prompt a certain humility there, but for the accident of fate or the grace of God or the mystery of fortune, go I. This humility, which can flow from a keener appreciation of the role of luck in life can open us at least to a greater sense of indebtedness and to a greater sense of responsibility for those less fortunate than ourselves. And so thinking about the personal dimension, the moral and spiritual dimension of this, I think that the challenge is to find ways in the way we live our lives, but also in the way we design our educational systems and allocate success that keeps, that, that makes those who land on top more keenly aware of the role of luck than is typically the case. Interesting. You know, I, I have um, long felt both about myself and about generations of uh, Rhodes Scholarship applicants, both successful and unsuccessful, that I've assured them it is a crapshoot. <laughs> um, and it's true, you know, and that it takes nothing away from the thoughtfulness of selection committees uh, right. who do their best, but there's certainly a huge amount of luck involved. And if we believe our own, uh, you know, that uh, believe our own press, I think that is a very dangerous, uh, dangerous direction. So that's and very we interesting. See this, if I could just build on that, Please, sure. what, what you've just now said takes me back to the years and years uh, during which I served on committees of selection. Yes. Uh, though I don't at the moment, but I did for many years. And I was always struck at the contingencies, seeing those deliberations. Who else was on the committee? Who, who was impressed in this or that way or put off in, by this or that uh, aspect of an interview or a candidate. I was always struck by the, the element of contingency that operated there to say nothing of reflecting back on when I went through the process as a candidate, um, completely believing that this was really just I mean, at the time, I thought this was really a roll of the dice. And in retrospect, who happened to be on the committee, what kinds of questions they happened to ask and to emphasize, and how the discussion happened to go. I mean, the, the element of contingency, if we reflect even on, a, on our own Rhodes interviews, mm. when we went through it, is, is uh, well, it's easy to, to forget, but hard not to be impressed by when we bring it bring it to mind. And in the case of, uh, well, perhaps you want to get to this a bit later, but in the book, I make what some may consider a provocative suggestion for admissions at the highly selective colleges and universities. Do you want me to get into that now, Elizabeth? Sure, or please. Save that? Go for it. <laughs> well, this is my proposal for admission by a lottery of the qualified, as I call it. The idea is that Harvard and Stanford get over 40,000 applicants a year for fewer than 2,000 places. 
the admissions officers tell us that a great many of those applicants are well qualified to do the work, to do it well, to flourish, to contribute to the, ed the education of their peers and classroom discussion. So suppose we took that seriously. You know, they say that is the prelude to saying, and therefore we have to expend all of this very careful scrutiny and effort and deliberation to make these very fine distinctions in deciding how to get the, the admitted class down to 1800 or 2000. I say, call out those who are not well qualified, take the rest, 15,000 or 25,000 or 20,000, whatever the number is, and admit from among them by lottery. I have a hunch, I could be wrong, but I have a hunch that the, the quality and the interest of the discussion in my classes would be no less lively and interesting than it is now. But more than that, it would be a way of sending the message to the students who were admitted, to the students who were not admitted, and maybe above all to their, their hovering parents off to the side. What is in any case true, that there is an enormous amount of luck mm. in this. And maybe that would also be a way of chipping away at this vaunted and steep hierarchy of prestige that I think reinforces some of the unfortunate aspects of meritocratic hubris. Do, do you think that's blasphemy? I think it, no, I think a... it's a, a well, I, it's a, it's a, I love the radical nature of it. Um, and, and I don't know what it would do to that ladder of prestige. I mean, so much prestige goes into within US higher education um, into the, the institutions that you know, re reject a very high percentage of their of their applicants. You know, that's what U.S. News uh, rankings are based on in in in, in significant uh, degree. So I think it is a really interesting suggestion. And, and I agree there... with you about the that you know for places like Harvard and Stanford, um, you would have as good a class um, with a with a with a random assignment whether whether it would chip away at the institution's prestige in ways that you know, uh, would be resisted by the institution, uh, I, I, I suspect it would. Um, it might, but yeah. just on, on, your, on, on that, the point that you made, isn't there something perverse in the idea that the prestige of a, of a college or a university and its desirability in the public mind should depend on how many people it turns away. There is oh, something absolutely. Out. It's actually one of my, my pet peeves having served an institution that was not in that hyper elite prestigious uh, um, category of, you know, where I think so much more should depend on what institutions actually do for the students that they admit. Um, exactly. You know, what is the value add of, of the institution. Um, but so that's a, you know, that's a, another debate about, about, uh, about higher education. I, I'd like to ask you, I, I, I want to make sure that we, we pivot to, um, to questions from others, but I, I just, I have to ask two more questions. I mean, one is, do you, what do you say to those who would, because as I was reading your book, I kept thinking this, that, that, you know, you're, you're critiquing a particular, and I think you, you know, I think you're aptly describing a certain uh, approach to, to merit. And yet, you know, when you talk about things like, well, let's really focus on what, pe how people contribute to the common good. And let's, um, let's honor that and dignify that. You know, could it, couldn't that be a, a more perfect form of meritocracy? Uh, meritocracy on the basis of the contributions people make. Um, you know, I mean, is, is the problem really meritocracy or is it, is it a failed uh, system of prestige and credentialism in, in your view? 
Right. Well, that, that's a great question. And you could say it's a critique of a certain version, a certain conception of meritocracy and of merit. I want to be careful by not conceding, not, not being thought to concede more than I am when I say that, Elizabeth, mm -hmm. because I don't want to say simply that the problem is that we fall short of the meritocratic principles we profess, which of course we do. Opportunities are not truly equal. If you look at the students who attend Ivy League, so-called Ivy League plus institutions, Ivy League plus Duke and Stanford and a handful of other places, there are more students in these places from the top 1% of families than there are from the bottom half of the country combined. So it's clear that we don't live up to the meritocratic principles we profess. We do not have anything like perfect equality of opportunity. I don't want to be understood to be saying simply that we need to do a better job of doing that, though of course we should remove whatever obstacles and barriers uh, deprive some of access that others are, are provided. But even if we could do that, even if we could achieve a perfect meritocracy in the sense that everyone really has an equal chance to compete, still, I want to, I, I do want to say the ideal itself is flawed. And it's flawed because of the attitudes towards success it generates. Where I agree with your suggestion, Elizabeth, is implicit in my critique of this way of conceiving even a perfect meritocracy is an alternative ideal that could be said to be about honoring contribution, contribution to the common good. So a big part of my critique is of assuming that the money people make in the labor market is somehow even a perfect labor market with perfect equality of opportunity, it still would not be a true measure of the value of people's contributions. So I would like to argue. Now, if, and I do argue in the book that we should focus on contributive justice, where we're not only concerned with um, enabling everyone to have access to a safety net, healthcare, access to education, important though those things are. Still, we could have all that and still not have a good society, unless it were also a society that enabled people, everyone, whatever their credentials, to contribute to the common good and to be recognized and honored and esteemed for doing so. Now you could call that a different kind of merit, but it's merit that is, well, it's, it's a merit that honors contribution to the common good properly understood mm -hmm. as a moral ideal, not as a, a, a contribution um, measured by the metric of the market. And this, I think, is in, in many ways bringing this back to politics. What I think many, uh, many miss in politics, including those, including progressives who do want to uh, uh, create a more genuine equality of opportunity, who do want to increase chance for individual upward mobility, focusing too single mindedly on upward mobility and on fair access to the fruits of consumption misses our role as producers, misses the element of contributive justice, misses the idea that work, the real dignity of work is not only that it's a way of making a living, but also that it's a way of winning recognition for contributing in a valuable way to what our fellow citizens need. And so you could call that a properly reconceived conception of 
merit where the metric is the normative question of what really counts as a valuable contribution to the common good. Mm -hmm. And that requires a public debate that enters into hard moral and ethical questions. But I think we need a morally more robust public debate than the kind to which we've become accustomed. And that in a way is what I'm calling for in the book. Right. One last question, and I know I'm seeing the chat has just like exploded here, but I can't resist. One last question, uh, which is, you know, how radical is your suggestion, is your proposal from, from the perspective of, of the economy, for example? I mean, I, I, I can already say I'm just glancing through the chat. People are interested, you know, is it universal basic income? Is it, you know, what, how do you see the, the mechanism that would actually make the kind of equality of condition that you see as a precondition for um, uh, this uh, uh, dignity of work possible. Okay. Uh, so tell us- Okay, well, let me take that in two parts. I do argue that beyond equality of opportunity, some people say, well, the only alternative is a sterile equality of result where everyone in some utopian or dystopian scheme has the same income and wealth. No, I think those, that's a false alternative. Beyond equality of opportunity, I argue for a broad democratic equality of condition, which is not where everyone has this, must have the same income and wealth, but where we inhabit and sense that we inhabit a shared life, a common life. And that requires reversing the tendency of recent decades for the withering of class mixing institutions, mm. public places and common spaces that bring people together in the ordinary course of life. This, I, so reconstituting the civic infrastructure of a shared common life would be one important part of this project. Another part is more directly economic. Economic, not only from the standpoint of trying to redistribute income and wealth from the rich to the poor, though I'm for that, but uh, what I think we need to do is to propose some concrete economic policies in tax policy, for example, that would prompt and provoke the, the richer public debate about the meaning of contribution to the common good. Here's one quick example. Uh, with an eye to, to promoting the dignity of work. What about a proposal to swap out the payroll tax, which in the US is a tax on labor, paid partly by the worker, partly by the, the employer, and is capped beyond a certain level. That's a straight out tax on labor. Swapping that out or part of it and replacing the revenue with a financial transactions tax. One that would be, would tax, for example, speculative finance or high frequency trading. Not mainly for its redistributive effect, though that might be an advantage but because it would force an argument about the value of the social contribution represented by say high frequency trading and the kind of work performed by people who pay the payroll tax. Here's another way of framing a similar debate. We should ask, why do we want to tax earnings from labor at a higher rate than earnings from dividends and capital gains. Again, one might come to that question with an interest in redistributing from the rich to the poor, and that's fine. But I'm arguing for a broader debate to prompt a, a substantive debate about the meaning of the common good and what counts as contributing to the common good. Some will say this this would be a very judgmental way of thinking and arguing and debating whose contributions really matter more from a, from a civic and a moral point of view. But that's exactly what I'm for. 
outsourcing this implicit judgment to markets does not, not make it any less judgmental. It just means that markets will decide these questions rather than democratic citizens. So those would be some debates of the, that, that I would like to encourage through various concrete economic proposals of this kind. Does that make sense, Elizabeth? Thank you. Yes, very helpful. Okay. Um, thank you. So let's turn it now over to um, the scholars and residents who've been involved in the reading group, uh, self-generated reading group on on uh, the tyranny of merit. Um, and I'm gonna, I don't know, I, I, I know Lucas is here, Lucas Tse. Um, can I turn it over to Lucas and then he will uh, moderate just for a few minutes um, uh, questions from, from the group of Rhodes Scholars. And I think there may be some other Oxford students involved in that group as well. Lucas. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, thank you so, so much everyone for coming. Uh, this is a really fantastic event. Um, and I just want to thank the other Rhodes Scholars who facilitated the discussions with me as well and everyone who participated. And also to Professor Sandel for writing a book that you know we that really allowed us to sink our teeth into. And I think as everyone here can um, tell by now, this book is really operating on so many layers. And I think that's something that we delighted in unpacking over several weeks. Uh, I think our discussions would range from economic questions to questions of self-esteem and how do you understand your own psychology. And I think it's really a tribute to this book that it allowed us to um, come at it from so many angles. Um, and of course, that also generates many questions, which is why it's nice to be here with you all and see um, a deluge of comments in the chat section. Um, <laughs> Um, which I think everyone can peruse slowly. Um, so I know that some of us have um, questions. So I know, Jenny, do you want to start? I, I know that you had one um, to, to, to kick us off with. Sure, um, one moment. Hi, Professor Sandel. Thank you so much for this really engaging, discerning book. Um, I had a great time reading it with our fellow Rhodes Scholars this month. So I wanted to ask you about your choice to center the bulk of your chapter on university admissions processes, uh, which you called the sorting machine, on the admissions practices of private elite Ivy Plus universities in particular. Um, I ask about this because while I was reading it, it struck me that you people care about which Ivy you went to more than the people who actually went to the Ivies. Um, and who are largely people already in aspirational professional classes. So in other words, my sense was that the people who have been culturally left behind in the way that you're diagnosing more largely in this book don't necessarily care if you went to Yale or Indiana University. In their heads, the distinction is less important right. than the distinction between going to college versus not going to college. Um, right. That may be focusing the bulk of the analysis and prescriptive um, institutional reforms on the private abbeys was missing part of the bigger story. Um, so all that said, I would love to hear your thoughts on the role that public universities or community colleges or two-year colleges might play in either entrenching or challenging the rhetoric of rising in the ideology of meritocracy in the US. Right, great, thank you, Jenny, for that. And I agree with everything that you've said. I, I would say just slightly in, in, in my own defense that one of the chapters is on higher education and the sorting machine. And a portion of that chapter is on this lottery proposal. But I want to emphasize, and I agree with you, Jen, that the lottery proposal is not a solution to the problem of the tyranny of merit broadly conceived. And I don't mean by at all to suggest that it is. It solves one uh, aspect of the, the problem, uh, which is that it, it works on the meritocratic hubris, maybe, but I agree with your basic point that if we're going to change this, we have to talk about not only public universities, because some of the selective public universities, prestigious public universities, in terms of their profile, student profile, and in terms of the, um, their relative lack of contribution to upward mobility, is very similar to the 
selective, highly selective private universities. So I think where we need to put much greater focus and investment is in making public colleges and universities more truly public, because in many cases now they are public in name only, only a small fraction of their budget comes from state legislatures. And so I think we need to massively invest in state colleges, especially, and two-year community colleges and vocational and technical training facilities. In the United States, this is highly skewed in a way that isn't true even in other democratic capitalist societies. Germany does this better, for example. They have a, a much better funding of uh, vocational and technical training tracks. And maybe not coincidentally, there is greater social esteem and honor and respect for those, for example, who go into the trades having followed this track. In Canada, there is not this steep pecking order of colleges and universities where people just, you know, convert the adolescent years into a stress-strewn meritocratic gauntlet. So it doesn't have to be that way. And I think, um, I think that the, the true reform of this system would have to emphasize, uh, and I think you're in, exactly right on this, state colleges, community colleges, both in terms of funding and in terms of social recognition and honor. Um, I, I also have you know, a brief passage about how we should not assume that civic education and the liberal arts must only be uh, the, the province of private universities or of highly selective public universities. Part of a, the democracy, the democratic equality of condition I was mentioning a moment ago, in addition to class mixing institutions, I think requires the diffusion of access to knowledge, to civic knowledge, to philosophy, to the liberal arts throughout the society. Instead, what we've done is we've concentrated the liberal arts in the citadel of higher education and then we conduct a meritocratic tournament to determine who has access to it. This, I think, is a deeply undemocratic impulse. So we need, I think, to diffuse access, not just to technical training, but to civic education and moral and political reflection to, throughout the, the um, learning uh, environments. And I would say even in the, in the workplace and in trade unions, so that there can be a, a true civic empowerment and opportunities for reflection of, uh, that goes well beyond those who get a four-year college degree. Jenny, does that begin to address it? Of course, but I really appreciate that. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I have one more, one question from Anant, who is also in the discussion group. Yeah, um, so one of the things we, we noticed in our reading group was that you, kind of, I mean, rarely mentioned the word capitalism or engaged in kind of critique of that. You used the more kind of nebulous word globalization, which, um, um, yeah, so I guess the first part of this question is why did you make that decision? Um, and then we also wondered why you chose not to engage with thinkers such as Marx who have written really thoughtfully on these topics. Because I mean, you mentioned earlier that, um, you know, reconfiguring the economy and is that, is it possible to rethink basic ideas such as winners and losers without thinking about capitalism? I think we need to think about capitalism. The word I use in this book, you're right, is I, I sometimes use the phrase market-driven capitalism to refer to what many would describe as neoliberal, global, sorry, uh, market-driven globalization to refer to what many describe as neoliberal globalization. But in the US, um, many people don't know what neoliberal means. It's a term that is more commonly used in Europe and in the UK. But I do think that um, we need to debate capitalism and what it means and to what extent the version of capitalism that has been enacted 
over the past four decades with market-driven or neoliberal globalization is compatible with democracy? And the, the answer, I think, is not very, not very compatible. And so whether we use the term capitalism or neoliberal globalization, um, the, the argument is, or the argument of the book is, that that's what we need to rethink. We need to rethink, and I discussed this to some extent and not in my previous book, What Money Can't Buy, The Moral Limits of Markets. We need to rethink an assumption that has run deep um, underlying our public discourse in recent decades, the market faith that market mechanisms are the primary instruments for defining and achieving the public good. It seems to me that this assumption was brought in explicitly in the 1980s, in the years of Reagan and Thatcher, but that when they passed from the political scene and were succeeded by center left governments and political parties, Bill Clinton in the US, Tony Blair in Britain, Gerhard Schroeder in Germany, they didn't fundamentally challenge this market faith, this assumption. Uh, they softened its harsh edges. They, to some extent, shored up the safety net. But we never really had a public debate about what should be the role of reach, a uh, role and reach of markets in democratic societies. And so, I'm very much in favor of promoting such a debate. And, and we did not have that. And the center-left parties from the 90s to the present did not really offer that debate with the exception of Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren in the primaries, but the mainstream parties did not. And this I think is one of the reasons why they seeded the ground, the sense of disempowerment that was widely felt by many working people to right-wing populism. Right-wing populism is typically, traditionally, a symptom of the failure of progressive or social democratic politics to address the sense of disempowerment that comes through an uncritical embrace of markets. And now, so I argue, markets abetted by meritocratic modes of justification for the, the, the rewards markets dispense. So that's how I, that's how I see it, and and Anat, I do see uh, that what form of capitalism, if any, is compatible with democracy. That I think should be at the center of our public debates. Thank you, thank you, Anat, Jenny, and and Lucas. Um, it is really hard to pick. There are so many great questions in the chat, uh, but I'm gonna. Uh, I, I thought I would throw it towards South Africa, because there was a, an interesting set of exchanges between Max Price and Eusebius McKaiser about um, whether a lottery, Eusebius, you said, uh, does a lottery just pass the buck? There needs to be a deliberate strategy to undo the contingent effects of past discrimination. Did you want to um, pose that question, uh, Eusebius, to Professor Sandel and, and get some South African perspective into this conversation. Eusebius, are you there? Are you muted? Well, maybe not. Okay. Um, uh, Max, Max Price, are you there? Because you guys were having this uh, interesting debate. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. There you are, Max. <laughs> hi, hi, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, well, I was uh, the first point was that, um, well, the comments for people who haven't been able to keep up with the wealth of comments started off by saying that although a lot is a radical idea, it's not untried, and it is there's a, actually a huge literature because in the Netherlands, in particular. Uh, implemented lotteries for the selection of medical students across all their medical schools. Um, and uh, the literature, when, when was saying 
you know, what would the class be like? Would the discussion be as interesting or not? There, there's actually a ton of work that has, has analyzed that. And the second point I want to make was that it's not either or, of course. And what the Netherlands tended to do was to select 20% of us uh, simply based on the top marks and then put the, and then there was obviously a threshold above which people had to achieve in order to have a strong chance of completing the course. And the lottery was uh, from that pool. And the third, which uh, uh, where Eusebius was intervening on that was to say, particularly in society, all of our societies are highly unequal, but having in mind the history of, of inequality in South Africa, as well as the desire for greater diversity in classrooms, a lottery might achieve a class that is representative of the pool from which you're drawing, but that pool itself is already so skewed that you may not get sufficient the diversity and the, um, the redress that you're seeking. And so my response was that I think that affirmative action can, can absolutely and go hand in hand with the lottery. The right. affirmative action has to happen in, in two ways. It has to happen um, to the underrepresented groups in the pool from which the lottery is drawn, because otherwise the lottery will simply represent the pool. But you also, and the Netherlands did this, um, weight the lottery so that the lottery over selects people who come from disadvantaged backgrounds or who have a particular gender or um, class backgrounds in order to, um, so, so, that, so that you achieve a class that may be more representative of society than representative of the pool, uh, which would otherwise uh, not occur. Um, and I think re affirmative uh, in that, with or without a lottery is essential because uh, otherwise we simply reproduce the that we inherit. Um, there are many other dimensions. I think the whole, the, 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 the Black Lives Matter and the understanding of, of white privilege, of privilege is, is another version of this. Um, as Michael was saying, what can we do personally? I think that um, as in, in becoming and making our peers, friends, families much more conscious of the privileges that we inherit, we can become a little bit more humble. And I'll throw out a last comment. Someone else suggested, you know, if Rhodes, if the Rhodes, the Rhodes scholarship system was serious about this, um, I, I could, well, I could live with and I could see myself supporting a version of lottery in Rhodes, in Rhodes scholarship selection. Um, because in the selection committees I've been in, more often than not, we have many candidates who would all make good Rhodes scholars. And the problem is you have to choose the best, supposedly the best. In fact, I mean, one of the problems of talking about meritocracy is that we, 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 we mean different things by what counts as merit. Um, and that's often reflected in the selection debate is that one person will think merit is the, 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 the points achieved in a GPA and someone else will think the merit is the commitment to social action or, or, or other things. So, and there isn't a right or wrong answer. And there's plenty of evidence that when you evaluate the reliability and validity of selection committee processes, they are highly unreliable. They are highly subjective. They are really influenced the social capital that bring individuals bring into the interview. A lottery would be a far fairer method. So if you simply have a threshold, a way of deciding who meets the criteria for a Rhodes Scholarship and then apply a lottery to that, I think it would be fairer all around than, this, than the interviewing process that we have. Thanks. Right, I would just say quickly that, you know, the, I agree with the idea of a weighted lottery that Max has raised. So it would very much be compatible with the lottery proposal to provide weightings that would uh, achieve diversity among, you know, along important dimensions. So I'm, I agree with that analysis. Thank you. Um, I wanna go next to Kofi Gunu, uh, uh, who talks about how your book resonated with his experiences growing up in Ghana, but is interested, Kofi, why don't you go ahead and ask your yeah. question about the evolution of the concept of meritocracy outside Latin Christendom. Kofi. Hello, can you all hear me? 
Yes. 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 Hello from Ghana. Um, yes. My, my question is, is exactly as I, as I put it out there, um, Professor, that I really enjoyed, um, especially your second chapter um, that, that described the history of, of this, this moral concept. Um, but um, left feeling a bit unsatisfied because it seemed very focused on um, a European or an American um, uh, historical experience. And I was just wondering if you've uh, also looked at some non-Western uh, sources of this idea and, on, and this obsession uh, with meritocracy. Thank you. Right. And thank you for that, Kofi. And in in the fascinating chat, thank you for that really full uh, account. You point to the um, the Gaokao exam in China, which is a, a kind of university admissions uh, a high stakes exam. Um, and of course, in China, the idea of meritocracy in governing goes back to the Confucian tradition in the idea that the ideal of leaders of a society should be those who um, have merit and virtue. It's worth noticing that this is a different, uh, th this has some affinity with Plato's idea of the philosopher king, the idea that ideally the ideal city should be governed by uh, those who know the good. Um, it's important to distinguish this earlier tradition of meritocracy in governing um, and in leadership by the best from contemporary meritocracy. Uh, in the Confucian and the Platonic version, both the Eastern and the Western, there was the assumption that an important part of merit in governance is virtue. Merit is a moral category, not just a matter of technical expertise. But in contemporary life, insofar as we rely on the idea that the best should govern too often, what we mean by the best is defined by a kind of technocratic merit, technocratic expertise. Neither Confucius nor Plato had in mind that the, that the smartest economists around would be best able to uh, identify the public good, the common good. And uh, th there's that famous phrase of David, David Halberstam, the best and the brightest. Uh, the referring to the, the glittering uh, assemblage of cabinet officers and advisors assembled by JFK and inherited by Lyndon Johnson. And Lyndon Johnson, when the Kennedy administration began, went to Sam Rayburn, his mentor, the Speaker of the House from Texas. And Sam Rayburn said, well, Lyndon, they may be all as brilliant, they may well all be as brilliant as you say, but I wish one or two of them had run for sheriff once. And what Sam, Sam Rayburn was suggesting, he was hearkening back to the idea, well, not in so many words, the Aristotelian idea of phronesis or practical wisdom, the kind of wisdom and judgment, informed judgment about the common good that doesn't necessarily correlate very closely with the kind of technocratic expertise embodied in the best and the brightest in the McNamara days, or in the technocratic experts among those economists who have had such a significant role in governing, many of them with Ivy League pedigrees and credentials, but who didn't do such a great job with the economy over the past 40 years, going back to Anat's point about neoliberal globalization. It was they who assured us that insisting on a neoliberal economic policies globally, uh, even though it might outsource some jobs to low wage countries, it would generate increased GDP and the gains to the winners could in principle be used to compensate the losers. That was the argument by the technocratic experts, the best and the brightest 
of the last uh, four decades. And it created wage stagnation for most workers, deepening inequality, deregulation of the financial industry, which we were also assured by the experts would actually redound to the benefit of all, financial crisis, a bailout that reflected the earlier uh, friendliness to and faith in the uh, finance, financial industry. So I think there is a long history of faith in governance by the meritorious, but I think it's very important to notice how divorced has our notion of technocratic merit and expertise become from the tradition of virtue, of the common good. And so, um, so I think this represents one of, the, one of the defects of our contemporary understandings of meritocratic governance. It, it's striking how, how bad a job meritocratic experts and elites have done in the last 40 years by comparison with the elites who governed in the previous 40 years, say from 1942 to 1980, both in terms of lifting everyone's incomes, not just those at the top, but also, I think the, it's, it's fair to say it's a summary judgment, I know, but the meritocratic experts who have governed over the, the period of neoliberal globalization basically have created the mess that we're in and they paved, they so discredited merit and expertise, they paved the way to, to the backlash, to Trump, and now a condition where experts are so suspect that half the country won't even wear masks. Quite a condemnation of uh, the last uh, the last four decades. There, um, I, I wanted to to switch gears to a question about psychology. As Lucas pointed out, one of the rich part rich elements of your book, Michael, is that it you're 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 making arguments at at multiple levels. And Christian Natiel uh, has a question about where everyone has status. It is also perfectly possible, after all, that no one has. Is this need for competition and stratification an inevitable, inevitable part of humanity? Christian, did you want to add to that question or po pose that question? Yes, thank you. Um, like I said, good morning from Hawaii. And, and a quick comment, uh, as President-elect Biden was giving his speech, uh, Professor, it was almost as if his voice went on mute when he said that people can go as hard as they're uh, as far as their hard work and talents will take them, it was as if I was listening to your audio book uh, when that moment happened. So it's interesting how sticky uh, these ideas are. But but yes, this um, reading was from James Baldwin during our second year retreat at Rhodes House. And he was just talking about the fact that America has this equality. People become unsure of what their status is, and therefore they constantly look for ways to stratify themselves uh, in comparison to one another. So I'd like to ask you, you know, with respect, to meritocracy, do you feel like this need for competition and stratification is something that humans may not be able to break from? Or, you know, are you aspirational and optimistic about thinking that perhaps we can and, you know, really give people the dignity of work that they deserve? Well, Christian, thank you for that. I'm, I am aspirational and I suppose idealistic in a way, or at least hopeful. Not that we can abolish all measures of distinction, honor, rank, and prestige. I don't think we can. I would, I would like to be able to help us at least discuss a way of changing the terms by which we allocate honor and esteem away from market defined measures of what's valuable toward morally uh, deliberated understandings, shared understandings of what really counts as a valuable contribution. I don't think it's possible to affirm the dignity of work without some sense of contribution, of contributive justice, 
of according honor and recognition as an expression of society's regard for those who do make valuable contributions. I think our immediate problem is we misconceive what valuable contributions are because we've not deliberated it. We've simply ceded it to the labor market and a flawed labor market at that. So now that may fall short, Christian, of a, a more thoroughgoing aspirational view, which aspires to a society where we don't recognize any differential contributions. Uh, I'm not sure that would be um, an ideal of, of a good society, but I would rather have the inequalities be less, the equality of condition be broader and more democratic, and the basis of social discriminations and the allocation of honor and esteem reflect more what society on reflection decides is worthy rather than based on consumerist or market definitions of what counts as a valuable contribution. I, I, I think that's, I, I'd be inclined to say that's ambitious enough, but maybe you think there's a, there's a more thoroughgoing uh, a radical ideal. If I could just uh, mention Christian, uh, uh, what drew our attention to that line, and it's true. I heard it too, Christian, in Joe Biden's speech, where he used the, the rhetoric of rising. He used that slogan, as far as your talents will take you. What's interesting is he didn't use that line much during the campaign. He did speak during the campaign especially talking about his father and lessons his father has taught him and upbringing, he did speak about the dignity of work. And for the book, I did archival word searches to see how often politicians and presidents used this rhetoric of rising, as far as your talents will take you. And it begins with Reagan, and then it increases with Bill Clinton, and is through the roof by the time of Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton in 2016. It's interesting that neither Trump in 2016 nor Bernie Sanders used that phrase very much. Uh, Trump talked uh, baldly about winning and losing. Bernie Sanders talked about addressing inequalities, not enabling people to escape as individuals from inequality. So they didn't use the rhetoric of rising, nor did Biden for the most part until you're right, there it was in, in that speech. So I think it's an open question whether he will be able to help move public discourse and the Democratic Party's conception of itself beyond it. Thank you for both of those questions. Terrific, thanks, Christian. I wanna turn it next to Lauren Spohn. Uh, this seems like a good segue, who's asking a question about um, whether the way you want to reconfigure the economy is compatible with a liberalism that allows for competing and at times conflicting visions of the common good. Lauren, why don't you jump in? Yeah, sure thing. Um, well, first of all, thank you. Uh oh, Lauren, you're frozen. Question, I mean, it's interesting to think about, you know, how the, it seems to me that the crux of defining meritocracy is what we base the idea of merit on, right? And so I'm compelled by this idea that we should sort of rearrange what we pin merit on from something that values high frequency traders more than nurses to something that would do the opposite. But I'm unclear how we can come up with a sort of comprehensive, comprehensive vision of what that good would be while still staying committed to a liberal framework that allows competing visions of comprehensive worldviews to exist within the same society. Okay, so Lauren, you wanna, you wanna preserve, you want this debate to take place provided it observes the strictures of liberal public reason, as they say in political philosophy. Do I hear you right, Lauren? Oh, 
I Lauren's there, but I don't think you, we, oh, there you go, Lauren. <laughs> yes, sorry. Yes, you can tell that I am. You can tell that I read Rawls at the Saffir Center for Ethics, Professor Sandel. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm channeling. Okay, yeah. Um, well, I would say this. The kind of public discourse I'm arguing for rejects the strictures of liberal public reason as you've defined them and as Rawls defines them. So you're right in noticing or sensing that and that may be grounds, uh, it is for some liberals, grounds for worrying about the politics of the common good that I argue for in the tyranny of merit, but also for that matter, in what money can't buy, and really all the way back to liberalism and the limits of justice, which Elizabeth mentioned at the outset. That was my first book, it was also the dissertation I wrote at Balliol back those many years ago. So yes, Lauren, you are right to pick up the continuing thread of argument. I think, but here's why I think you shouldn't worry about it, Lauren. Let me, let me, let me see if I can persuade you. Where I disagree with Rawlsian liberalism is, I don't think it's possible or even desirable to define basic, the basic rights and duties of citizens in a way that is neutral with respect to competing conceptions of the good. I don't think so. And that's an argument I've been making for a very long time. The way that argument comes to bear on my case against the tyranny of merit is that I think to find an alternative to the tyranny of merit, we need not to outsource to markets the judgment about what counts as a valuable contribution to the common good, but to engage in democratic debate about that very subject. Now you, Lauren, are right to suspect and to worry from a liberal point of view that means that we are bringing competing conceptions of the good directly into the heart of democratic public discourse. To reason about what value, about whether a nurse really does contribute something more valuable than a high frequency trader, for example, is to argue about the good. It's not, it's not to be neutral with respect to the good. Anytime we debate what counts is a valuable contribution that we want to honor and recognize. You are right, Lauren is right. This is not neutral. This is, you might say it's judgmental, though it, 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 it involves the judgments and sometimes competing judgments of democratic citizens who may disagree about what's valuable, about because they disagree about the, the meaning of the common good even of the good life. My reply is, I think that this, that bringing debates about the good and about what to value and what to honor and what to recognize directly into democratic public discourse is unavoidable unless you believe markets can decide those questions for us through the labor market. More than that, it's not only unavoidable, it's desirable because it is a way of according greater dignity to work. It's a way of questioning and challenging the verdicts of value the labor market would otherwise deliver and install. And it's desirable because it makes for a more morally engaged civic life. And I think part of the frustration with politics that has led to the anger and resentment, and not only by working people, is a sense that our public discourse has become hollowed, hollowed out, empty of larger moral meanings. And this is connected to our reliance, not only on markets, but on technocratic expertise, technocratic merit, so-called. 
So I'm for taking back a lot of what the technocrats were deciding and what the markets were deciding for democratic citizens to debate. And yes, that does bring debates and disagreements about the common good directly into public discourse. But I think that's an argument in its favor, not an argument against it. Lauren, it may be a, may be a longer argument before we can, can sort this out, but it's an astute question and it identifies a thread that has run through arguments that I've made even before I, I began to focus on the tyranny of merit. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, ask Lucas to ask our final question. Um, Lucas has a question that really gets at the heart of what does this all mean in terms of our lives and what's your advice for particularly young Rhodes Scholars? Lucas. Thanks. Um, so before I ask this question, I just want to say that it does maybe skew more towards um, what current Rhodes Scholars have on their minds as they're starting out on their life decision, etc. But I really appreciate the kind of intergenerational dynamic here. Um, and I think we should all go and have more reading groups across <laughs> 65 years um, of people who've been in Oxford. Um, but that being said, my, so my question is about how you see success. Um, um, and it may link up with merit, but it's a more personal question about success. Um, so the other day I was talking about your book at dinner with my partner. And I think when you talk about a book at dinner, it's a good sign that it's a live argument. Um, and we were saying that it seems like the, the, the thread in your argument in this book, but also in your previous book, and when you speak that you found arguments that seem to really um, flourish, that you seem to be flourishing in the um, work that you are doing um, and I'm not sure how you personally define success, but I think ultimately there are obviously a, a, a plethora of institutional questions to work out about meritocracy. But there's also that personal spiritual question of what is success to you and how it links up not only to merit, but also to happiness. And of course, as you said, to dignity of your, your own work. And so on that more personal note, I wonder whether there are any specific stories you have to share from the, the, the beginnings of your, when you're starting out and thinking about what would be dignified work for, your, for you and what advice you might have for those of us who are perhaps pondering those decisions um, at, in this earlier phase of life. Thank you. Well, thank you, Lucas, not only for the question, but also for having organized these discussion groups and for having really prompted this gathering. Um, and it's, I've learned a tremendous amount from it. And, and I've only begun to glance at the wealth of questions submitted in the chat, which uh, could occupy me for more than an evening. Thank, so thank you so much, Lucas, for that. What is success and what is success in personal terms? I think success, this is maybe too impersonal a definition, but I, I think success, it has, it has to do with human flourishing as you just mentioned, Lucas. But I think success is ultimately exercising our human capacities to contribute to the common good and receiving recognition for doing so. Now this element of recognition may seem unnecessary. Why insist on it? Well, it's because it, it, it flows from the idea that what is ultimately satisfying is not something that is a purely idiosyncratic or even individual judgment. Of course, it's true that different people flourish in different roles, in different jobs, in different pursuits. And it's certainly true that each person has to decide for herself or himself what career, what path to pursue. So in that sense, flourishing is an individual matter. But not only not fully, 
because to live a good life, a flourishing life, a satisfying life, depends that we contribute to the common good. And the only way we can know that we've contributed to the common good is to see our work reflected back to us. Now you might say this in some ways, Anat goes back to your point about Marx, who gave us this very rich concept of alienated labor. What begins to heal the alienation of labor is this element of seeing ourselves reflected back to ourselves through a social life to which we have contributed. Another way of putting this, it connects actually, you might think paradoxically, Marx's account of labor and work with the papal encyclical on work and with Catholic social teaching, which emphasizes this feature of work, this element of recognition. It's the idea I guess the idea comes down to this. The fundamental human need is to be needed by someone, by one's fellow citizens, and to be recognized for answering or responding to that need. I don't think this need for recognition is mere pride or narcissism. It's the need for the human person to find herself or himself situated in and appreciated by a common life, a common way of life. So that's, that's how I would conceive uh, Lucas' success and human flourishing and meaningful work. Now, that may be the too, too philosophical, too impersonal an answer, because what you really want, Lucas, is for me to give an example, I suppose, from my own experience of how I wrestled with this, as you and as Rhodes Scholars in Residence are wrestling with this question now. I don't have any anything decisive to offer from my own journey, except to report that when I, when I graduated college and when I came to Oxford and started at Balliol, I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. I really didn't. I knew that I, I had long been interested in politics and in economics and in history. I was attracted to political journalism. I had done a, a lot of political journalism during my college years, including spending a summer as a reporter for the summer in Washington covering the impeachment proceedings against Richard Nixon. That was pretty cool and I was riveted by that. And when I arrived at Oxford, I thought maybe I would study some philosophy just to fill in my background so that I could get back to more practical things, politics, political arguments. I thought maybe I would be, if not a political journalist, maybe I would enter politics. I thought of that. I was drawn to that for a while. Um, or maybe be a, an academic, but that, that did not loom large. And in my first term and then my second term at Oxford, I started reading some books of philosophy and political philosophy. I thought it would take me a term or two, but I found myself intrigued. The second term, my philosophy tutor insisted I had to read Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, try to make sense of that. I thought that had nothing to do with my interests as I then conceived them, but I did it. I followed along. And then in the third term, I was put in a tutorial on, on Hegel and Marx and read my way through those texts. And then it began to become increasingly interesting. And 
And then, well, I had to read about Plato and Aristotle after that. And then Spinoza. And then Rawls had just written The Theory of Justice. And Nozick had written a reply. And I read those. And I read Hannah Arendt's The Human Condition. And before I knew it, I was hooked. Not because I had plotted out more carefully or more deliberately my career plan. Not because I had some determinate idea of human flourishing or success, the kind of things we've been discussing. But I was drawn to it and drawn to the questions. And I wound up spending four years and writing a dissertation on liberalism, rethinking views about liberalism that I had unreflectively embraced, I suppose, until I began reading these books. And I wound up teaching political philosophy, but I always wanted, I always wanted to connect philosophy to the world, to try to make sense of the world in which we live, to inform public debate. And so in some ways I tried to combine my newfound passion for political philosophy with a kind of political journalism, or at least kind of engaging in public with discussion of these questions. That's a long and roundabout answer to your question, Lucas, about how I came to this set of interests and to these passions and to this path. And I suppose, reflecting on it, what it suggests more than anything else is something we talked about, Elizabeth, earlier, which is the, the role of inadvertence, of serendipity, mm. of luck, of, for, of the fact that for all we try to exert mastery and control over the direction of our lives and our careers, especially those of us who wind up being Rhodes Scholars, some of the most valuable life lessons and life journeys come from elements of, of accident, of inadvertence, of luck, of good fortune that exceed our aspiration to mastery and control. What do you think, Elizabeth? That is a powerful note to, to end this rich, rich conversation on. Um, Michael, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I was, I was uh, so struck by uh, Lucas saying, wow, we should do reading groups with, uh, with across 65 years of Rhodes Scholars. And I'm looking at my colleague, Rodolfo, maybe we should, you know, if, if people are interested, you, you've given us the syllabus, uh, Michael, a rich array of, of, uh, of books that inspired you and of course your own work. Um, but I just, I want to, uh, first of all, I want to apologize to all the people who had these fantastic questions in the chat, but we couldn't get to you. As, as Michael said, uh, we could have talked for hours and hours and we will save that chat and share it with Professor Sandel. So, Thank you. Uh, so you know, your, your questions and provocations and, and inquiries uh, will be shared uh, with him. Uh, I wanna thank all of you for joining us. I wanna thank uh, uh, Rodolfo and Georgie for, for, or, for organizing this, Lucas for inspiring it and, uh, and Lucas and his colleagues uh, who, who um, are following in that tradition of, of engaging with texts and thinking deeply about them. And above all, please join me in thanking Professor Michael Sandel. Thank you so much for uh, engaging so deeply and richly with us uh, this, this evening. Um, this was a wonderful conversation and uh, we so appreciate uh, the, the, the depth of thought and thinking and provocation that you contribute to uh, political philosophy and to the Rhodes community. And thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for really a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. All the best.